Welcome to another moment in the Word. Are you anxious? Are you troubled by what's going on in the world today? Do you find yourself glued to the TV and wondering how the war in the Ukraine is uh, escalating? Do you find yourself worried about the economy? You're caring about the things, and it's an over-concern. It is where it's a consuming concern about your family, about your health, about perhaps your life in general, and therefore it's consuming you. Well, if that be the case, know that that's a characteristic of all of us as humans. And that's why Jesus put such an emphasis on anxiety. He has been talking about two masters, and we can't serve two masters. He's been talking about two visions. You can't be double visioned. You can't have your eyes set on the things above and things below at the same time. You can't be omniscient. You're not God. And so consequently, what happens is we become anxious because we can't control all of those things. And that's why Jesus now takes us to a rhetorical question. The question that he asks is in verse 27. He says this, which of you, by being anxious, can add one cubit to his stature? Notice that he has been talking about anxiety four times in this section. He said it in verse 25, where he says, therefore, I say to you, be not anxious for your life. And then he says in verse 28, why are you anxious? And then again in verse 31, therefore, be not anxious. And then again in verse 34, be therefore not anxious. That's an imperative command that we're not to be anxious. But how can we stop worrying? The word worry actually comes from a German word, wargen, which means to choke. And therefore what we're doing, and Jesus talked about it in the sower, in the four soils, and the cares of this world that choked off the seed, is that we are choking off the Word of God and the Spirit of God from controlling us because we are wanting to take control. You see, that's what the word anxiety means, is that we want control. But the fact is, we don't have control. In fact, we have control of very, very few things in life. And that's what Jesus is pointing out. He's not only pointing out that not only do we not have control, but the birds of the air, they don't have control either. But they depend on the Father. And notice, they don't worry about worms. They don't worry about what they're going to eat. They don't worry about nesting because the Father provides for them. And he's going to, after verse 27, he's going to talk about the lilies of the field. He's going to talk about flowers and that God provides for them. They're clothed far better than we are. And so consequently, it's so important that we depend on him. So he's asking a rhetorical question, a question that has an obvious answer. And he's asking us, he's asking you, he's asking me, which of you... And now he says, by being anxious. The word being anxious is a present participle. We would call it today perseverating. In other words, it's where I'm thinking and obsessing on something and I can't get it out of my head. And so now I start to think about the war that is in the Ukraine. And then I start to think of contingencies. Oh, what if they do this? What if they do that? What happens to us? How is this going to affect me? And I think of all of the contingencies, all of the what ifs, and maybe you're doing that with your family, and you're thinking about your children, and you're thinking about, well, what if? And you're thinking about health. Well, what if I have this? What if I have that? What if the doctor didn't check this or check that? What if the medication doesn't work? And so consequently, we do all of these what ifs, We're leaning on our own understanding, aren't we? And leaning on our own understanding will always bring us to anxiety. And so what our Lord is saying here is, which of you, by being anxious, and the next word is can. And the word can is dunamis. We get our English word dynamite from it. Which of us have the power to make any difference? And if I think about something in my head over and over again, that will increase my heart rate. It will affect everything in my body. In fact, I may create the very problems I think I'm trying to avoid. But I don't have the power. And that's the key. 
I have to recognize that the one who has power is a my heavenly father. Remember, that's how this began. Our Lord was taking us to pray after this manner. Our father who art in heaven. He's in charge. He has the capacity because he created all things. And if he created all things, how shall he not provide all things? He sustains, and that's what we find in Colossians chapter 2, that all things are sustained by our Lord, not by us. We have no power. And so consequently, he says, which of you, by being anxious, can add one cubit to his stature? Now, this is the part of the passage that actually can be translated one of two ways, and that is, It either is referring to our actual stature, and that that would be true. Which of us can add, and a cubit is approximately 18 inches. Well, can you, by thinking, worrying, focusing on your stature, add even one inch? Maybe you can lose pounds, but you can't add inches. And so consequently, that's what he's saying. But it also is this, because both in classical Greek, Plato uses this word, as well as in the Hebrew text and even in the New Testament, we find this referring to life itself, not just your stature, but the length of your days. For instance, we find in Psalm 39 and verse 5, we find David is saying, behold, You have made my days as a handbreadth. Notice he's saying as a handbreadth. In other words, about six inches. That's the length of my days. And compare a handbreadth to a light year. And that's precisely what he's saying. You're measuring your life by inches while God is looking at light years. That there is an infinite number of days but we are focused on just a few. But can you add even one more day to your life? That's why Moses is the one that writes Psalm 90, and he is talking about the length of a man's life. And he says this, that we ought to be, and he says, teach us to number our days that we might apply our hearts to wisdom. In other words, as I apply my heart to wisdom, I am not worried about when I'm going to die, how I'm going to die, but instead that I might have wisdom because wisdom takes me beyond the grave. If you're a Christian, if you know Messiah, you know that he died on the cross. He was buried three days and he arose from the grave. He is alive. He's coming back. There is an eternity that's yet ahead for you, because Jesus promised, and he said this to Nicodemus, that God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but shall have what? Shall have everlasting life. You're worried about the days of your life? You're worried about the events of this world? There's a kingdom to come. There is joy and peace and holiness and righteousness that is yet to come. We worry about things we cannot control, and then we worry oftentimes about this world rather than the world to come. And so that's why Jesus says, which of you, by being anxious, can add, and you can translate the word Cupid also as a measure of time unto your and now life. Can you add one more day to your life? When the time comes, then God will call you. And if you're a Christian, he'll call you home. I'm reminded of another passage, and that is in the Gospel of Luke, where Jesus is actually using this same expression. It has a little more detail, so that's why I'll share it with you now. And that is that there is a man that has come to Jesus, and he is talking about his will, and he says, Master, speak to my brother that he divide the inheritance with me. 
And you know how it is sometimes with wills and we get all upset and buried and worried about how the money will be uh, distributed. And then Jesus says, take heed and beware of covetousness for a man's life consists not in the abundance of things that he has. And then he then gives a parable of the rich fool. And the rich fool, if you're in Luke chapter 12, looking at verse 16 down to 19, you find the personal pronoun I and my used over and over. Listen to what he says. What shall I do? Because I have no place to bestow my crops. And he said, this will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater. And there will I bestow all my crops and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. The next words are in verse 20, but God. God says, this night, your soul is required of you. You see what is happening here? We have no control over what is going on around us. That is really ultimately God's control, and he's promised that all things work to the good, and therefore we should be asking God, how is this working for good? Where is his providence? Where is his glory shown even in our seeming moments of desperation? And then Jesus says, life is more than food and the body more than raiment. And he says, verse 25, which of you by being anxious can add to his stature one cubit, the very verse we just saw in Matthew, if you then are unable to do that which is least, why are you anxious about the rest? And that's the very point, isn't it? If you can't add one day to your life, if you can't add one inch to your stature, if you have no power over that, then why not trust God? God has all things in control, doesn't he? Are you trusting him? Are you having his peace in your life because you've given control to him? If you keep that control or you think you do, then you'll be anxious, you'll be tormented, you'll worry, and you will be very sad in the, re in the end. Trust God. Let's pray. Father, thank you and we praise you that you have given us your peace by knowing you and by knowing that you are in control because you control us now. And we know the joy and the Holy Spirit working in us that brings peace. And therefore, Father, we are at peace regardless of our circumstances. Bless my brothers and sisters and especially those who are in the Ukraine or in Eastern Europe or in Russia. And that you truly, Father, would be glorified in their lives and they would know not only the peace of God, but the God of peace. And that they would, Father, trust you in this hour of desperation. And we pray, Father, for each one that's listening now, that you, Father, would be our consolation and our comfort because you are our Savior. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen.